Next on Unsolved Mysteries. Three friends set off in a boat. Only one comes back alive, and he's accused of killing the others. A tragic motorcycle accident leaves a young woman brain damaged. Now she's missing, and police need your help to find her. And if you do the Gulf War, the Oklahoma City bombing, a deadly earthquake in Japan. Does the Bible contain a secret code that predicted these events? And meet two women who swear by a controversial treatment for MS, honeybee stings. Five stories, they're all strange, but guess what? They're all true. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Florida, three friends set out by boat for a night of partying on Honeymoon Island, a mile off the coast. Two of them don't return. Freddie Doberly and Mary Lou Holmes are found murdered. The third man on the boat, Glenn Consagra, is charged with a double homicide. Before his trial, Glenn pleads guilty to second degree murder, but once in prison, he claims that he's innocent. I don't think there's any question that Consagra's guilty of the offense. The evidence is overwhelming, and I'm not surprised by his continued attempts to, uh, to escape the punishment for the crimes he committed. I didn't kill Mary Lou or Fred. They were my best friends. We were celebrating a very wonderful occasion. We were just best friends out doing their thing together. It was a special time for us, and it turned to tragedy. No, I didn't kill him. A convict who claims he's innocent is nothing new. But what makes this case unique is that Glenn's story is backed up by a private investigator and a special task force of the Public Defender's Office. They found information and a witness who support Glenn's claim that someone else gunned down Freddie Doberly and Mary Lou Holmes. Glenn, Freddie, and Mary Lou plan to spend the evening on Honeymoon Island celebrating the birth of Glenn's grandchild. Glenn says that on the way to the island, their boat broke down, but they managed to land at 10 p.m. on a spoil bank, a tiny man-made island about halfway to their destination. They decided to stay, build a campfire, and continue to party. Freddie and Lou drank all day, every day, so it was pretty much a, their natural state of mind to be intoxicated. And uh, they were arguing about something. I don't recall what it was right now. It's probably minor, but I was uncomfortable, and I was tired anyway and kind of discouraged. And, uh, I thought, well, I'll go ahead and lay down and rest, and in the morning, things will be better. Glenn fell asleep 30 feet away behind a bait tank. the gunshots, I, I panicked because we didn't take any weapons with us. I, did, I didn't understand why there was gunshots out there, but I knew something was going wrong. And so I laid there for a long time until later I heard the sound of a boat motor crank up and fade out into the distance. I don't recall just how long a period of time lasts between the time I heard the gunshots and the time I heard the boat motor crank up, but I, I just had a sudden panicky urge to get away from there. My friends had disappeared. Someone had attempted to sink the boat. The motor was missing. The campsite was in disarray. I knew that something had gone wrong. And whatever it was, I didn't want to be a part of that. I didn't want to be a party to it. Glenn used the styrofoam cooler lid as a float and swam back to land. At dawn, he arrived at the same dock the group had left from the night before. It was then that he decided to invent a story about what happened at the spoil bank. He said that Freddie and Mary Lou had taken the boat to buy more beer and never returned. 
He did not mention anything about the gunshots. My concern was that if the murderers knew that I was a potential witness, that they might come after me. Three days later, the Coast Guard found Freddie and Mary Lou's bodies floating naked just off the spoil bank. They were tied to a boat engine and anchor. Two 22 caliber bullets were found in Freddie's body. Mary Lou had been shot twice with a shotgun. Glenn had been seen with a shotgun and a 22 the days before the murder. He admitted to being on the island. He was the natural suspect. We basically found that uh, there were bad feelings between him and the victims, that he had made threats toward the victims, that he was in possession of the two exact types of weapons that were used to kill both of them. We know that within days of the murder, Doberly had not paid for a car he had received from Consagra, refused to make any payments. The suggestion was made by another witness, well, why don't we go over there and we'll rough Freddie up and make him pay? And Consagra said, don't go over there. I'll take care of it. The Sheriff's Department uncovered additional information that implicated Glenn. There were rumors that Freddie was a police informant who had fingered Glenn as being part of a stolen property ring. A witness who claimed that Glenn had threatened Freddie also told authorities that Glenn had asked him to provide an alibi for the night of the shootings. Glenn was charged with first degree murder. But before the start of his trial, he pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of second degree murder in Freddie's death and no contest to second degree murder in Mary Lou's death. By plea bargaining, Glenn hoped to be eligible for parole in six months. Instead, he received two consecutive life sentences. My attorneys came to me with different statements that different witnesses had made. And I said, well, how does it look? And they said, well, Glenn, you have about a one in five chance of winning this case. And if you lose, they're asking for the death penalty. I was having nightmares about being placed in the electric chair. And I just couldn't, I couldn't tolerate it anymore. And whenever they gave me these options and encouraged me to make that plea, I made the plea. I saved my life. What he's suggesting is that he intens intentionally perjured himself. He lied to the court because of some uh, possibility that his lawyer told him about. And that, I think that's ridiculous. He's pleading guilty to two life terms. And that's not a decision that he or anyone else would take lightly. Glenn's family contacted Steve Milwe, a private investigator based in Tampa. He gave Glenn several lie detector tests which he says Glenn passed. The prosecution insists the tests were unreliable and dismissed them as evidence. Steve went to areas of Tampa Bay where Glenn and his friends lived, hoping to find new evidence. I began to track down the witnesses who were at least listed as witnesses back in the original investigation and speak to them and I began to find inconsistencies in what they had previously given sworn testimony toward. I, I don't want to talk anymore about this. It's going to get me killed. In this videotaped confession, a woman whom we'll call Donna told Steve a startling story which supported Glenn's claim of innocence. Donna said that she went out to the island that night with two of Glenn's associates. One of them, whom we'll call Ted, was a key witness who had implicated Glenn in the crime. According to Donna, Ted was angry at Freddie for being a police informant and went to the island, in his words, to take care of business. I'm gonna fix you real good. You've been opening your mouth too much, Freddie. After a fight, the second man held a shotgun to Mary Lou and Ted dragged Donna to the campfire by her hair and forced the 22 caliber pistol into her hand. So you might as well just tell me everything. Tell it to me straight. Don't lie to me. I thought the truth. Want who? Donna claims that both she and Ted shot Freddie and that the second man murdered Mary Lou. She also said there was no sign of Glenn Consagra on the island. This particular witness has been repeatedly diagnosed as suffering from chronic schizophrenia. She repeatedly and continuously 
fabricated stories for no reason about things uh, of importance and things of no importance. People who are emotionally disturbed aren't automatically disqualified as witnesses. They can see what they see. And if they can relate it in a rational, believable manner, why shouldn't they be believed the same as any other person? Describe how Freddie was standing. After confessing to the private investigator, Donna was questioned repeatedly by the sheriff's department. She told six different conflicting versions of her story, but she never backed off one important point, that Ted, a key witness against Glenn, was involved in the murders. And there were other unanswered questions suggesting that the murders were committed by more than one person. Freddie and Mary Lou's bodies together weighed nearly 300 pounds. Adding the weight of the anchor and the boat engine, how could one person have carried that much down the beach and 30 feet into the water? And if Glenn had committed the murders, why would he sink his own boat, leaving himself at the crime scene with no other way back to the shore other than a dangerous swim? This particular person that uh Donna suggested uh, was there and committed the murders is a well-known and very close associate of Glenn Consagra. If in fact that individual was on the spoil bank and did have a loud argument with Freddie Doberly, then Glenn Consagra would have immediately recognized his voice and been able to tell law enforcement from day one that this is the man who committed the murders. He has never done so. When I first came here, people used to laugh at me when I would say I was innocent. They'd say, oh, yeah, me too, you know? But um, I think the reason I should be believed is not because I say anything, but because the record now speaks for itself. The state conducted three separate investigations. Each concluded that Glenn was guilty as charged. Glenn Consagra was never able to prove his innocence. He spent 16 years in prison and was paroled. Two years later, he died of a heart attack. Next, a young woman disappears after a near fatal motorcycle accident. San Francisco, California. One November night, 27-year-old Selena Eden was on her way home from a union meeting. After the accident, she was in a coma for six weeks, and uh, she had some brain damage. She had a long way to go. Selena was admitted to the hospital. Her mother and brother came in from San Diego. Selena, baby, look who's here. Dion. Hi, Dion. Hi, baby. How you feel? She had lost a lot of her memory. So it really kind of took away her personality. Don't leave me, OK? Don't leave me. She appeared to be like a child again. Like she didn't know too much anymore. You know, she just, you know, like, like a child. Selena's left eye had been permanently damaged. She suffered painful headaches. Her left thigh was crushed and a severe head injury caused fluid to build up around her brain. Still, Selena began a demanding regimen of physical therapy. Just a little bit of weight. Selena was the type of patient they had to slow up. She wanted to do everything in a hurry. It was just that she was like rushing everything. She challenged herself to the max and it was like a lot of things that she just couldn't do. And I guess she just uh, wasn't ready to accept the fact that she wasn't well yet. Two months after the accident, Selena moved to San Diego to live with her mother. Doing good. You know, when she was living with me, she started having more like confused episodes. There was a lot of changes and she was having a lot of headaches. Uh -huh. so we'll do that. Physically, Selena was getting better, but mentally, she was worse. Are you all right, baby? Mama, who was that I was talking to? I don't know who you were talking to. Did you forget? Yes. Things like that would upset her. That's when I noticed her frustration more and more, and she wanted to 
be on her own, but the more she pushed it, the more confused she was becoming. Selena decided to return to San Francisco, hoping familiar surroundings would help her recovery. She's very happy to be in San Francisco and to be around her friends. But, you know, she didn't appear healthy enough to be on her own. She was very unaware of a lot of things. I think she definitely needed somebody to be with her, you know, to help her. About a year after the accident, Selena's mother received an unexpected phone call. Hello? Hello, Mama? Selena. Mama, I'm going away for a while. I met someone who promised to be kind to me. Who? She was evasive Selena. with me. Don't and that wasn't like her. She know. would tell me everything, you, you know. Home. I said, Selena, what you need to do, you need to I'll come back home. And she said, well, don't worry if you don't hear from me in a month or two. And then she said, I'll be calling you soon, and hung up. And that's the last I've heard from Selena. The last time I heard anything of Selena, she was leaving for somewhere in the Midwest with some woman who she had just met. And I had no idea who it was. And uh, I couldn't get a last name from her. Uh, and it was just kind of a haphazard plan. There was no plan. It's like, I'm going. Selena's family hired a private investigator to search for her. Even after she told her mother that she was leaving town, she was sighted in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. The investigator followed up on all the leads, but never found her. And if you do see her, mm -hmm. would you give me a call? Yeah, sure. Thanks. You know, I just hope she's out there probably, you know, just living her life. And for what reason she didn't call us, maybe it's just because she forgot us. Maybe she just don't remember. You know, hopefully it's one of those stories. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we can find her. I want to see my daughter again. That's my baby. I love her like I love all my children, and I want her back with us. I want her to try to call or someone call for her if she's unable to call, and let us know where she is and how she is. On New Year's Eve, one year after she disappeared, Selena left a garbled message on a friend's answering machine. It was the last time anyone heard her voice. Selena's family and friends continue to believe that she's alive somewhere in the United States and most likely lost and confused. Selena Marie Eden was born in 1962. She stands five feet, seven inches tall. At the time of her disappearance, she weighed about 110 pounds and she walks with a limp. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, are there codes in the Bible that can predict major world events? This man believes that he has found them. For many, the Bible is the word of God a moral instruction manual on how to live a proper life. But for journalist Michael Drosnan, there are hidden messages in the words of the Bible, a secret code that he claims has predicted the most important events of the 20th century. The Oklahoma City bombing was encoded with the words terrible, frightening death, and there will be terror. The great Kobe earthquake in Japan that killed more than 5,000 people was encoded with the words earthquake, fire, Kobe, Japan, and the year that it took place, 1995. The Gulf War is encoded with the words Hussein, enemy, scuds. Ever since there was a Bible, people have been searching for secret hidden messages in the Bible. I can tell you that there is no doubt that the Bible code does exist and that it does detail events that took place thousands of years after the Bible was written. In September of 1994, Drosnin had a letter hand delivered to Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Mr. Prime Minister, an Israeli mathematician has discovered a hidden code in the Bible. The only time your full name, Yitzhak Rabin, is encoded in the Bible 
The words assassin that will assassinate cross your name. That should not be ignored. I think you are in real danger, but that the danger can be averted. 14 months later, Rabin spoke at a peace rally in Tel Aviv. As he left the podium, he was gunned down by an assassin. Is it possible that this event was foretold nearly 3,000 years ago? The Torah is said to be the word of God brought down from Mount Sinai by Moses. It makes up the first five books of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. Most scholars say the Torah predates the birth of Jesus. Prague, 1938. Rabbi H.M.D. Weismandel discovered the first known example of Bible coding in modern times. The word Torah was spelled out when he skipped every 50 letters in the book of Genesis, skipping the same number of letters in the books of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy had the same result. Coincidence? The odds were against it. In 1985, Israeli scientists Duran Witsum and Eliyahu Rips used the computer program called a skip code to find words and patterns in the Hebrew text of the Torah. A skip code tells the computer to start with any letter of the text and then skip through the letters at chosen intervals. In his book, The Bible Code, Michael Drosnan uses this example to show how it works. If you skip every three letters of this sentence, it would look like this. You're left with a new sentence. In this case, the encoded message is, read the code. The Israeli mathematicians ran a skip code searching for the names of 34 prominent Jewish rabbis from the past 1,100 years. Amazingly, all the names were found encoded in the book of Genesis along with their Hebrew dates of birth or death. According to Drosnan, the odds of finding the dates with the names were 10 million to one. The published report caught the attention of Harold Gans, a former code breaker with the National Security Agency. When I first heard about it, I dismissed it as simply ridiculous. When Gans wrote his own computer program to verify the results for himself, he also found the encoded names of cities. He later learned that these were the cities where the rabbis had either been born or died. The odds here were more than a million to one. I set out to prove that it was nonsense. Instead, I ended up proving that, in fact, it was true. I must admit, I felt a chill go up my spine when I, when I saw it corroborated. Using the skip code programs, Drosnan searched the Bible for the names of historical figures. According to Drosnan, Adolf Hitler is encoded with the words Nazi, enemy, evil man, and slaughter. Pearl Harbor is encoded with the words destruction of the fortress, World War, and December 7th. According to Drosnan, Watergate is encoded with Nixon, and who was he? President, but he was kicked out. In the case of the Oklahoma City bombing, Drosnan says the code includes the name of the structure that was blown up, the Murrah Building. The date and time of the attack, and even the name of the man convicted of the crime, Timothy McVeigh. But not everything in the code is gloom and doom. Drosnan says that Shakespeare is encoded with Macbeth and Hamlet. The Wright brothers are encoded with airplane, and the phrase man on the moon appears with spaceship and Apollo 11. But there are some who aren't buying it. Humans are pattern-seeking animals. We look for cause and effect relationships in our environment, meaningful ones. The Bible code is nothing more than a form of seeking you shall find. Whether you're using the Bible or the dictionary, the yellow pages, some other novels, all you need is a long string of uh, letters and then you can 
run your computer skip code sequence program and come up with all kinds of things. Drosman says he ran the skip code program on several books, including Tolstoy's War and Peace, but found nothing of significance. He is convinced the secret code is exclusive to the Bible. Every major figure in world history I have looked for, every major event in world history I have looked for has been encoded accurately in remarkable detail in the Bible. Can the Bible code also predict our future? In 1997, Michael Drosnin offered this prophecy. The most terrible warning that's encoded in the Bible is of a possible nuclear world war within the next 10 years. The words world war and atomic holocaust are both encoded in the Bible with the same two years, the years 2000 and 2006. I'm not calling that a prediction, but a warning. Thankfully, these events did not come to pass. Well, now, wait a minute. You can't prophesize the end will come, the end might not come, the end might be delayed, or the end might not come at all. You've now made all possible predictions, which is no prediction at all. That's not prophecy. The Bible code, as far as I'm concerned, does not predict anything. It warns us of possible dangers. It doesn't give us one predetermined future, but all of our possible futures. Drosnin also claimed that in 1993, he found the word twin, the word tower, and the phrase, they will collapse, fall, at exactly the same place in the Bible. At the time, he believed that it was in reference to the terrorist bombing of the Twin Towers that had occurred in February of that year. After 9-11, Drosnin and the Bible Code scholars say they looked for and found the name Bin Laden and the word airplane in the same location. According to Drosnin, in the year 2012, Earth will be pounded by comets. But other encoded doomsday predictions never materialized, including a 2005 smallpox epidemic in Israel and a nuclear attack on New York City in 2006. Mr. Drosnin is a journalist. He is reporting on a very complex mathematical work of world-renowned mathematicians. He has not used scientific methodology, and his actual conclusions are logically unsound. It is far better, in my mind, to sound a false warning than to fail to warn of a real danger. People sometimes say to me, where's the good news in the Bible code? Why all these predictions of terrible catastrophes? And I say the good news is that some intelligence cared enough about us to encode the Bible and leave us these warnings so that these dangers could, in fact, be prevented. Next, a police officer flees after being arrested for child molestation. And later, can honeybee venom reverse the effects of MS. Meet two women who say they are living proof. On a previous broadcast, we presented the case of Charles Muley, a 10-year veteran of the Slidell, Louisiana Police Department. Muley was arrested at a local motel where he had just molested a 12-year-old girl. At the time, he was the sergeant in charge of sexual offenses for the Slidell Police Department, and his victim was a young girl that he was assigned to counsel. Considering the serious gravity of these offenses... Muley was indicted on over 25 counts relating to the molestation and rape of six young girls. He was released on $150,000 bail. Eight months later, on the morning that his trial was set to begin, Muley was reported missing. For more than three years, his whereabouts were a mystery. Update. 
Charles Mulet has been captured. Within minutes of our broadcast, the FBI received several calls from viewers who reported that Mulet was living in Ocala, Florida, under the assumed name Joseph John Tranchina. Mulet had seen our broadcast and left the area for three weeks. When he returned, he was placed under arrest. Mulet was convicted on multiple counts, including aggravated assault against nature, molesting a juvenile, and jumping bail. Mulet has served his time and his probation, and he is now a free man. Understandably, most people try to avoid any contact with bees. But to some, honeybees are miniature flying drugstores that could reverse the course of multiple sclerosis. It is a controversial treatment known as bee venom therapy. Kelly Ames was in high school when she noticed the first signs of multiple sclerosis, or MS. By the time she was 22, her symptoms were impossible to ignore. One day I was in work and I was walking down a flight of stairs. There must have been like 12 stairs where I just lost the feeling in my feet like all of a sudden and I fell down a flight of stairs and the women in my office were like, wow, you know, I explained to them that my feet sometimes get numb. The disease first robbed Kelly of the ability to walk alone. Then it attacked her eyes. Donald, I can't see anything out of this eye. I'm Within that week, I lost the vision in my left eye and I had no control over my muscles. It was just very devastating. I hated to depend on other people, but at times I needed other people to help me. Kelly's doctors put her on steroids, which can temporarily relieve the symptoms of MS, but no drug can stop it. Having the steroid dripped into my arm, I would sit there for an hour and a half looking at other MS people coming in in wheelchairs and wondering if that's gonna be me someday, you know, in that wheelchair. Then Kelly met a woman who had literally walked away from her wheelchair after learning how to sting herself with honeybees. Kelly's father brought her to a local beekeeper who had been helping MS patients for years. Kelly, these are the honeybees that are gonna He help. told me that he didn't wanna be bothered by me if I wasn't serious about it. He said, you have to do this for six months straight every other day faithfully. Increase it by two every other day until you get to 20. And he scared me when he said that because I realized that I really had to take the responsibility of sticking to this. And I did. Kelly and her boyfriend set up a morning routine he placed the bees at specific spots on Kelly's body where nerves running to the damaged areas were easy to locate. For Kelly's failing eyesight, that was behind the ear. Bees were also placed on Kelly's lower back to treat the weakness in her legs. They were left in place for as long as 15 minutes to allow all the venom to penetrate the skin. Dressed, come back, okay? Okay. Kelly's nervous system had been so impacted by MS that she was stung several hundred times before she actually felt the pain of the sting. I could actually feel what a bee sting felt like, and it hurt. It really hurt. I was screaming. I had my head in my pillow, and I was screaming. And I was screaming because I was happy because I could feel again. Within a week, my eyesight started to slowly come back. I didn't depend on my cane as much. And right then and there, I just knew, finally, this was kicking in, and it was working for me. Okay, what I'm gonna do is grab the bee. Kelly ended up teaching bee venom therapy to others suffering from MS. Some doctors dismiss it, but Kelly's remarkable recovery is not unique. When I decided to do bee venom therapy, we kind of kept it a little hush-hush because I didn't know what other people's reactions would be. Um, I knew what the reactions from my doctors were, so I figured, you know, well, we'll keep it a little quiet. I was always afraid of bees and being stung, but I just felt that this was my only answer. A local beekeeper taught Marine how to grab the bee's bristly neck and cause it to jab its stinger at precisely the right location. I was told to sting right on the top of your foot right here, okay? By the time Marine began bee sting therapy, her feet were so numb that she could hardly sense 
They were there. To the touch, they were icy cold. Okay, I think that's long enough. Within minutes, my foot was warm. You could feel the venom going through and the blood it felt like, you know, there was life in my foot again. It was just an incredible feeling. I knew right from that moment that something good was happening and I, I felt that this was going to help me. This photo of Maureen and her son was taken six weeks after she began beef venom therapy. She had just crossed the finish line in a seven mile MS walkathon. Success stories like this have some doctors saying that bee venom therapy is far too promising to be ignored. At first, it may be easy to dismiss bee venom therapy. Uh, the fact is, it sounds a little kooky. However, in studying about bee venom, there are certain substances which make sense in multiple sclerosis therapy. We know that the immune system is involved, and of course, the neurologic system is involved. Therefore, bee venom, which has components which affect both the immune system and neurologic system, is a natural substance which seems to have some effects in MS. One note of caution. Many people are deathly allergic to honeybee stings, so anyone considering this treatment must consult the doctor. Next. Two brothers discover they have a sister they have never met. During World War II, U.S. and Allied forces succeeded in crushing German and Italian strongholds in North Africa. But the victories came at a high price. Among those killed was Army Private Harry A. Young from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He left behind a wife and two sons. 37 years later, in Stratford, New Jersey, Harry's son and granddaughter came across his obituary while researching their family history. But the information seemed as if it had been written for a different man. He was survived by a three-month-old daughter, Kathleen, Mother's first name was right and everything, but the address and the fact that there was a baby girl mentioned and me or my brother was not mentioned. Papers do make mistakes, and uh, I thought maybe that they had got the information wrong, and I had a copy made so I could go into it further. Albert's search for answers took him back to the early days of World War II. After the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Harry Young and millions of other Americans rushed to enlist in the service. I can't stay here while there's a war going on. I need you to sign this paper. But with a wife and son to support, Harry needed his wife Laura's permission to go to war. I've been gone six years. You've done a great She job. refused. Harry walked out and never returned. He didn't know that Laura was pregnant with their second son. Four months later, using forged documents, Harry enlisted in the army and was sent overseas to fight. Only then did he inform Laura of what he had done. Mrs. Young? This yes. is from the War Department. One October day, Laura received word that Harry had been killed in action. When Laura filed papers to claim Harry's death benefits, she received a big surprise. Mrs. Young, there seems to be a problem. We have another Laura Young who has already filed for Harry's death benefits. But I'm Harry's wife. Well, that may be, ma'am. Do you have a daughter? No, I have two sons. Well, this certainly does pose a problem. There were two women collecting benefits for one man, and that's when it had to be proven that my grandmother was indeed the first wife and was never divorced from my grandfather. This means a lot to me. Now. Apparently, after leaving Laura, Harry began living with another woman named Estella. After Harry's death, Estella filed for benefits using Laura's name. Eventually, Laura was able to prove that she was Harry's wife and she retained all benefits for herself and her two sons, Albert and Jimmy. 
For nearly 40 years, the details of Harry and Estella's love affair were kept secret from his sons. Then, a letter written by Estella surfaced. She had sent it to Harry's parents the day after she learned of his death. In the letter, Estella revealed that she and Harry had a baby daughter together named Kathleen Mary Young. When I read the letter, I got the feeling that she was very much in love with my grandfather, that she was devoted to him, and she would do anything in the world for him. Hello, Mr. Young. I'm Estella. After receiving no reply to her letter, Estella paid a surprise visit to Harry's parents, but they wanted nothing to do with her or baby Kathleen. As far as anyone knows, that was the last time Estella and her daughter had any contact with Harry's family. Now this whole mess, there's no real winners. There was a lot of, lot of time lost between uh, family, really. I think it's something that's really important for my father and my uncle to know their sister. They need to know who their sister is and share their life with her. Update. When this story aired, Kathleen happened to be watching Unsolved Mysteries. The story surprised her because she had been told that no one on her father's side of the family cared to meet her. It makes me feel, I don't know, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like special in a way that they took the time in all those years that now that I know that they were looking for me. Kathleen and her family traveled to Stratford, New Jersey to meet her half-brothers for the first time. I saw the film. How you doing? Fine. Okay. When I hugged her, it, it was euphoria. It, it felt wonderful. I knew it was her as soon as she stepped out of the car. It, it, that, that's, a, that's a young. After 50 years apart, they were finally a family. Good. Welcome to our big family.